Hello, everyone. How are we all doing? How are we all doing? Are you all fed? Food's good, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I had like three of those boxes, you know. It was really, really good. I'm really excited to introduce Tim, Tim McNamara. We all know him as Tim Clicks. Uh, he's the author of Rust in Action. And please give him a massive, massive hand. Hey, thank you. It's, it's a... Uh it's a very genuine pleasure to be here in London. Uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. I uh, am from a little place on the wrong side of the world called New Zealand. Uh, and before I begin, I would like to just kind of have a small acknowledgement. The, as I was departing the uh, upper part of the North Island had been hit by a very severe cyclone. And as I, as I left, about 1,400 people were completely uncontactable. Uh, two firefighters actually died because the house that they were checking on got hit by a landslide and uh, killed them. So I would just like to take a very small moment to say thank you to all emergency services workers for their service and for their communities wherever they are in the world. Hello, London. <laughs> All right. It's actually, so uh, my name is Tim McNamara. Um, you probably know this boxer. If you don't, um, don't tell my publisher. Uh, what I do at my job is lead the global training program for Rust inside AWS. We are on the beginning phase of actually trying to teach thousands of software developers how to make use of this amazing technology. I want to share a little bit of the thinking that we've been going through to kind of make this a reality. Uh, and I thought, you know, since this is an hour-long talk, the best thing to do would try to give like a 20-second version. You want to be able to create a positive feedback loop that involves supporting your staff who are struggling because Rust can be extremely annoying and pedantic. <laughs> as helpful as the error messages are, sometimes you just kind of want to throttle the compiler. That is normal and natural. Uh, and sadly, a lot of people walk away from Rust. And your job as a leader in the company and by the way, if you're at a Rust conference, it doesn't matter how you are thinking about your own competence, you will be seen by the rest of the people in your company or in your organization as a Rust leader. It's kind of incumbent on you to provide that support and coach people through. Uh, I recommend when you build out the next thing with Rust, to do, to, uh, to asp not just aspire to produce something with technical, exp uh, technical excellence, but really think about creating a product that is going to, that you're going to be able to show off later. So for example, uh, put proper documentation in there, give it real tests, and really demonstrate that Rust is a small bubble of uh, it's a, it's a little wonderful garden inside the rest of the technical debt and uh, kind of the ugly weeds that are in the, the rest of, 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 of the company. Because what you don't want to do is say, we'll just start little and then we'll just improve it later. You're never going to fix it later. <laughs> like, it turns out that everyone is busy. If you want to uh, have a product that uh, you can really use to demonstrate the capabilities of Rust, then do it well. This was actually supposed to be a 20-second version. Um, your ultimate goal is effectively to kind of reduce attrition, strengthen your team, and therefore enhance the product and improve your ability to recruit. Because the stronger your team is, the stronger your product will be, the stronger your product is, the easier it will be to recruit and retain your staff. 
Okay. Rust is growing exponentially. If you want to be uh, the, in the top half by experience of all Rust developers in the world, it's pretty easy. You just wait nine months. <laughs> Quite seriously, it's been growing uh, with uh, around about that doubling rate since about 2012 and pretty much any metric that you can find. Uh, whether or not that's like subscribe, sort of social stuff in terms of like subreddit stats, uh, crates.io downloads, uh, even things like the stars of the, uh, the compiler open source project. Rust is growing very, very strongly. That means that it's really important to kind of treat the beginners nicely because there will always be a majority of people in a growing ecosystem that are new. And as senior leaders within that ecosystem, it becomes more and more important to really demonstrate strong, uh, really demonstrate really good practice. Because eventually, like the forces of darkness will come. You try and push for rust, and then someone will say, that's expensive. Like, this is wasting our time. And you need some strong, uh, you kind of need some strong comeback to that. Uh, the other thing that seems to be quite odd is that even though Rust is really, really popular, a lot of people have like hobbyist experience, but there is a huge amount of uh, difficulty actually pulling people into the team. We don't seem to trust anyone else's expertise. So to ensure its longevity at work, you really need a strong case. And here's one. Users actually deserve safe programming languages. Uh, a, quite a lot of the problems in our world are caused by problems with software. And it turns out that there is this crazy figure that kind of keeps popping up around between 60 or 70%, um, or in some cases even more, where safety problems, uh, memory safety problems, affect core software infrastructure, noting that, by the way, software is essential to every single industry in the world. Uh, and it turns out, if you go, you know, the Android example, though we'll go back to Android, they have just, uh, the, the Android project has just released a blog post say, stating that the, they've uh, introduced 1.5 million lines of Rust code into Android. They've been able to find zero memory safety problems. That compares to their C++ code, uh, where they have uh, approximately, the historical average has been about one bug, like one major or severe CVE um, per every thousand lines of code. It's actually time that the software industry gets really serious about its impact on the planet. It, uh, wasteful programming languages uh, essentially are completely unnecessary now. It will save a ridiculous amount of money to actually move to Rust. This has been established by multiple companies, and here's a good write-up. And particularly on the... Uh, so. I reduce 75% of my CPU, but also 95% of memory usage. And it turns out most cloud vendors charge a lot of money for memory because memory is quite hard to virtualize and oversubscribe. Uh, but that's actually, you know, it's not an isolated case. On the Rust website right now is a case study from Tilda. Uh, there are a, uh, they have a software agent that, li ho that lives on their client's machine. If, by the way, if you've ever clicked on the PDF, like it's quite good. <laughs> uh, they moved from Ruby to Rust, saving their customers. Uh, the, the problem was that their customers often deployed uh, their agent inside places like Heroku, and they had very fixed uh, instance sizes. And when they would, the memory threshold would get reached, their customer's application would shut down. So that was kind of a big problem. On the server side, uh, it just completely changes the game if you don't need to spin up, let's say, an eight gigabyte instance, or then it's like, well, we're having a memory leak, so we'll just like, increase to 16 and then 32 gigs of RAM. 
And then suddenly we have like these 64 gigabyte instances to manage this application that kind of keeps getting hungrier and hungrier. And what I want is for that to stop. Like that isn't an acceptable state for software. And by the way, <laughs> like we, we don't need programming languages like this anymore. So here is a program that you can't write in Rust. So this is C. Uh, spot the bug, it's quite a fun game. I made this mistake many times when I was learning Python. I used equality, I used assignment when I should have used equality. Rust will refuse to compile this. Rust is pedantic. Rust will make you uh, think. Um, here is a, uh, a runtime crash, it's essentially a bug inside some Java code that is guaranteed to crash because the iterator down here is attempting to change uh, the size of the array list that it's iterating over while it's going through. Rust's ownership model will completely prevent this class of errors. Um, <laughs> like we, we, our tools are really important, and yet we still, like this is kind of state of the art on the web. The set data type is, um, so uh, uh, just the computer science definition of a set uh, would be, um, in case you're not aware, you're trying to essentially remove duplicates. So the, the, the uh, intuitive answer is that the size of the set should be one here, it's two, and presumably that's because uh, JavaScript, the runtime is actually looking at the, ex the, the locations in memory and saying, are these at the same memory address? Now, if I'm a JavaScript programmer, I don't care about memory addresses. And um, Rust, on the other hand, will actually require you to opt in to the semantics that you want. If you really care about like value equality, having exactly the same uh, pieces, um, uh, having exactly the same objects that have the same values, and that's what equality means for your type, then that's what Rust will um, that, that's what you can provide. But if you require a pointer equality, uh, or you want to check memory addresses, you can do that too. By the way, I've got some group participation coming up. I had some great fun uh, finding some terrible stock imagery while I was looking for backgrounds of rust and steel. So we all get to do something really neat. Um, <sighs> Here's, here's some, like, here's my first, that's not quite what we want, is it? We need something, we need something that's kind of more, uh, now, now at least the, the cogs are together. We're working as a team. This one, though, is really good. Okay, what I want everyone to do is uh, hands together out the front, and we're going to, like, count to five, and we're going to rub as hard as we can. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, good, you can all breathe. Now, here's the thought experiment. If we were to concentrate all of that energy, could we like, with all the friction, would we be able to like ignite fire? Um, like the heat that we've generated collectively uh, is dissipated through the room. But what I want to say is that uh, one of the problems you've got is it's actually quite hard to engineer a system to move all of the heat into a concentrated location because you know people are rubbing their hands. Software has this unique uh, difference, though. It enables people to work together with almost complete leverage. The software industry will be part of every single solution that the world faces in the future. Like, that is how fundamental your role as a software developer is, and that is one of the reasons why I think Rust is so significant as a programming language. The, uh, and by the way, you can make use of this leverage by just contributing and working together. So let's think a little bit around, now that we've got this rationale, that unsafe isn't actually very acceptable. And by the way, we want to save our company money. Uh, and by the way, we want a programming language that doesn't allow us to make silly mistakes. Um, just remember this feedback loop, that your strong, your, uh, a strong product requires a strong team. 
and a strong team will enable the strong product. Now, it turns out, though, you've got to kind of start from somewhere, and that means that you need to grow either the team or the product to start. We kind of need to teach people Rust. We need to grow their mental model. We uh, start maybe with some data types, and then we kind of get into this really weird problem. <laughs> we get to get these questions like, like, what's the difference between a string and like this ampersand stir thing? Like, a string literal is not a string? What? Like, there are lots of problems some li like that. Uh, but my, my argument is that if you can provide guidance, you know, people can start building things with more complexity, and then over time, you know, you'll be really surprised by what people can build. We just need to trust people and get them through this kind of weird phase of vertigo. Okay, just to talk about a little bit about how crazy Rust is, because we're cool. Like, what? Uh, how do you close a file descriptor in Rust? Clearly, you call a close method uh, on your file object, right? No, you call like stud mem drop because we kind of overloaded the uh, drop trait. And uh, these are the kinds of small little fish hooks that come up when you're learning the language. That essentially, Rust is very well designed. It has this wonderful trait abstraction or a series of abstractions, and the, the uh, drop trait is particularly elegant because it applies almost universally. But it's kind of bucketed inside memory because it was primarily there to uh, work with, with memory. But we also use it for closing processes and things, and so uh, this causes a lot of confusion if you're looking somewhere for a close method because you want to close the file descriptor. There's a bunch of these. What's the correct way to <laughs> like, create a string? People will want an answer because as soon as they have to think when they're learning, they are worried that they're going to make a mistake. It's not their fault. Uh, it's kind of Rust's fault. <laughs> like this is a non-exhaustive list of the ways to represent text inside the Rust programming language, with inside the standard library, ignoring third-party libraries. Uh, now, each of them has different semantics, and each of them has a very good reason for being. Rust cares a lot about how, uh, cares a lot about internal representations and wants you to opt in or specify exactly what semantics you want. But that comes at a cost, and that cost is like severe pain or mental anguish for people learning the language. I, my argument is that the trait system itself kind of attacks working memory. This idea that you have maybe five or seven things that you can keep in your head at any given time. It's like, well, is this the copy trait or is this the clone trait? Oh, is it two string? Is it, why, is it, why is it two string and display? I don't, why? Like, and like, like as ref and borrow? You go and you, you know, so I'll look that up in the, in the, in the um, standard library documentation. They have exactly the same, same type signature. And it just makes it very complicated to, to feel at ease with the fact that you have learnt the language. Uh, at least that's been, that's been my impression. Uh, here's another one. That like a box is an absolutely absurd term to use because I had this idea that I was like, uh, I, was, I had to put something into a tie, like a box kind of implies that there's a container. That's not what a box is in Rust or C++ or who created that term? By the way, why is it not called a string, like a, a text type? Like I. I get that the mathematical concept of a string is there, and a lot of the terminology in computer science kind of originated in, um, in mathematics. However, this is just more jargon to learn, and it confuses people who are starting. Uh, the stack and the heap, the stack's really confusing, partially because the stack actually goes downwards when you, um, and also, it does, it's, it's not a data structure in the sense that you manipulate it or you create it. Um, 
the stack pointer is over in a register in the CPU, so it's kind of this weird hybrid between memory and a CPU and your programming language and programming environment. And there's a lot of context that you need to learn in order to kind of get a real understanding about how memory works. And by the way, unit type? Thanks, maths. Like, um, anyway. Uh, here are a few questions that, um, and by the way, there will be others that you will encounter, uh, because as leaders, what is the difference between string and stir? Which I think we should start calling pretzel stir. I think it's kind of fun. <laughs> uh, can you explain the difference between dynamically sized type, zero size type, fixed size type? Why? In what? Interior mutability? Is, how does that work? To explain to me uh, the difference between a pointer, a reference, and a raw pointer. And uh, because they're exactly the same thing if you were to kind of look in a debugger. Why is the static lifetime a static lifetime? You know, there's a whole bunch of questions that sort of come up. Why is it three terms that mean, like, if you look in a dictionary, these would be synonyms. Static, constant, immutable. However, they refer to very distinct things, and they've got very different semantics. There's just so much to learn. Uh, this phrase that you use, zero cost abstraction, is that actually true? And by the way, fearless concurrency, is this something, that, is concurrency something I'm supposed to be afraid of? Um, a trade, ob I, I don't know what that is. Like, that sounds odd. Uh, <laughs> I actually asked this. <laughs> I, I was a Python programmer for 10 years before I learned Rust. Um, uh, uh, can I, I, I've wanted to do this about four or five times, um, dynamically create a type at runtime, and then call a val like, on a string, which by the way, if you've ever in a Python curve, is how like name tuples are instantiated. Um, anyway, but there are things like question mark operators, you know, should we, like which primitives do I use and which like, it seems like we need to, I've got mutex and RC and arc, and how do they all get worked together? Because there's RW lock, uh, sorry, um, and there's cells as well. And I, it's quite a lot, actually. And um, like, there are, like, there's a minefield in here. Here is a program, more gangrenous instead of dangerous, by the way. <laughs> um, any guesses on how many, like, which percentage of the time this will run correctly? Like, will run, with, run to completion? Uh, hands up for more than 50% of the time. No, one, one, yes, I love the conviction. Uh, who wants to say, oh, sorry, the answer, by the way, um, is about 25% of the time. Three quarters of the time, arbitrary operations between, sorry, an addition operation. Oh, this, <laughs> there's no C. This was, sadly, this was me last minute slide editing. So, just apologies here. So, let C equals A plus B. Okay, so now we have a C variable. Apologies. Uh, so the idea is that I've got two arbitrary integers, and I want to combine them with an addition operator. Some of the time it's going to overflow, and that's going to blow up my program. And by the way, it gets, and it, it happens uh, with, in this case I simulated a couple of tens of thousands of times this morning, um, about 25% of the time it'll blow up. It's much worse with, uh, with multiplication. You think if uh, you implement addition uh, you multiply, let's say, any arbitrary integer by two, half of the integers on the left-hand side are going to overflow. Uh, that means that actually it's much more likely than you think if you're accepting arbitrary input or like a number as a parameter that you're exposing yourself to denial of service attacks. Um, here's one that I introduced myself. So this is an excerpt um, that I, from my book that I actually... Um, adjusted for a talk once, and then got embarrassed to, to find the crash. So Rust tries to be really um, nice to Python programmers like me and provide indexing operations, but for one of these lines down the bottom here, there is no zeroth field, and it crashes. 
So integers, like uh, in the, the other pattern, which I haven't got an example for, is using arbitrary, or you, we, ho holding indices around, like a, a U size, uh, and using them essentially as pointers to get around the borrow checker. And when you do that, you're exposing yourself to um, invalidation. So here's, here are some tips. Like, if you can add this to your program, it will be stronger. The problem is you're exposing yourself to like the CI system breaking when Rust updates because warnings change. Do add documentation, and by the way, there are clippy lints which will enforce and check that you are uh, doing it really well. Or well, at least, so for example, you can require that safe, uh, unsafe blocks are commented with why the operation is safe. Do use structured logs rather than just arbitrary print statements, um, probably via open tracing, via the, the tracing crate. The, um, I am a big fan of removing strings from, or like it, removing end user data as quickly as possible from my program. So if you can parse a, some input data into uh, some concrete type early, you'll never have to worry about calling validate before because you're never going to hold on to a string that could be invalid. If you can kind of get things into an enum, your whole program is going to be um, more thankful for that. I really like advanced testing, like fuzzing and formal verification, uh, the so-called lightweight formal verification, where we can actually uh, use mathematical reasoning to guarantee uh, certain properties of our program. And I thought I would kind of start by concluding with a couple of ideas for, progr for a project, like group work that you could try. Create cheat sheets. One of them could be a cheat sheet about all the concurrency primitives. Or, uh, so we could actually reason about ref cell and RW lock and so forth. You could go and download and pluck something from the internet, but it would be m a much better learning activity if you go and do it yourself and maybe use the internet uh, to check. Go and there's uh, a talk by uh, my colleague John Jensett, um, one of his um, very famous series, and he goes and implements uh, cell, I think, um, but you can go and actually go and dig into the standard library and explore how things are implemented and maybe even do it yourself. I thought about this one. The Rust cookbook is wonderful. We've got um, hundreds of little snippets of code. Why don't you think of, a, of uh, some 10 line snippet that you could contribute to that project? Likewise, you're depending on presumably hundreds of open source repositories. At least one of them has a bug. <laughs> Maybe one will have an open issue that might even have like easy or starter issue. You could take it upon yourselves to say, look, we want to upskill in Rust a little bit. Let's maybe contribute, or like use actual code uh, as a way to teach ourselves learning, uh, teach ourselves um, uh, how to contribute and so forth and be active participants in the community. Go and dig into parts of the standard library that kind of are interesting and, and that, that, that really ex uh, feed your curiosity for the language. I like the debug macro. It's quite neat how it will actually take an expression, print out uh, what happens as well as its result. And um, I found that quite fun to kind of go in and take a, uh, a look at. But there are other types that are really interesting do feel free to kind of open the book and look inside the source code. I kind of, uh, you know, previously, when I started in my career, this would have been an IRC bot. Um, but writing a chatbot of some description can, uh, is, is actually quite a nice project because you can write it badly quite quickly and get something that responds to you. But then there's almost no ceiling about you know, how performant it could be or how sophisticated it could be and whether or not you add logging or telemetry or metrics. And uh, it actually is something that's off, uh, off the um, uh, 
I'd say critical path of re your application, because if you have to leave it for six to eight weeks, people will moan that the bot isn't responding to commands, but no one's actually going to uh, lose their jobs because the, the chat bot stopped um, sending images or something um, upon request. So as we kind of come to the, uh, the close of the talk, I want to stress again this idea that the UK and Europe are, and your own company are all part of a global ecosystem that you can foster. Uh, you know, this is a bit cringe perhaps, but uh, the coral reefs are really interesting because of how fragile they are. And they require every plant or every part of the reef requires every other part. And I think the open source ecosystem or software ecosystems are similar. Once you've got some sort of sufficient body of um, of, of, of like you've got a biosphere there, then you really start to see um, like a lot of wonder happening. And you can do this within your company. It just takes a little bit of support and encouragement, especially for those people who are new. Because your experienced staff will fall away. Uh, but, and you don't want to leave a big rust orphan uh, for somebody in the company. Um, with that, I would like to say, kia ora, kia maya, kia kaha, which is be well, be staunch, and be strong. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Tim. And. Uh, have we got any, any questions? If we don't have any questions, I've got a giveaway. <laughs> I actually have five copies of the book. I've left them back at the hotel. Uh, but I guarantee that they exist. Um, and therefore, as an added incentive, I am more than happy to give anyone who would like to ask me even a patsy question. Here's one at the front. Um, a book. That, that hand was definitely first. Um, this talk was very interesting for me because I'm actually on this battle right now with my team. Uh, we do have a few Rust projects already, but mainly it's me and one more person. Uh, we are trying to get our team together to work with Rust and be confident. And yeah, I think I start some of this. Um, like we have a like small project, like, hey, let's change this and let's do this together. And <laughs> the problem is that people, like I keep postponing, like, oh, next week, I'll give you more, one more week for you guys. <laughs> like, look at it, like do something then we can chat about. And we always get this question, this uh, answer like, oh, I didn't have time this week. Or I couldn't do it because I have all the things that I'm assigned to, I'm doing. So do you have any yeah, suggestions okay, so, so on this direction? Here is a, another strategy. So you can build up small project by small project and, small, and take off bigger and bigger things. Here's an alternative approach. Go for, a, like once you have established some confidence in the language, go for a big meaningful thing that will be difficult. Because the pain that you will experience kind of integrating that or rewriting that large thing in Rust will be approximately equivalent to figuring some smaller project of some uh, out, but the benefits will be significantly larger. Almost by definition, the big, ugly, hairy thing is uh, what is where kind of the business value are is, and that's another way to kind of increase the priority uh, of of like this Rust. Thank you. Um, is this one on? There we go. Yeah. Tim, do you want to say, I guess, say that's probably one of the best talks I've ever seen, especially just linking it back into things like our ecosystems and our climate change and everything else that you talk and you're so clearly passionate about. Um, I guess I'm just wondering, in terms of 
those important features of Rust which make it more efficient and more secure, how do we link those elements of climate change and the importance of doing this for, for, into that more often? See, I can't answer this in a very persuasive way because I'm one of these crazy eco-warriors. Like, I've been, I've changed my diet, I've, I ride the bike in to work, I, when I work in the city, and uh, I think that the link, there are a lot of people that will almost turn off because you say, we need to save the planet, therefore we're gonna do this in rust. Like, that's not, I think that has to be secondary for like a, a company is only going to take a strategic bet in a new programming language, which is a very risky thing for a business because you're, you're sort of exposing the company to uh, trends. You know, you're, got, you're moving from something that's known, uh, let's say like a Java or a C Sharp or whatever, or a Python or JavaScript or whatever, um, into something that's unknown and scary. And if you encounter a, if you, if you make that link explicit, it's like, well, by the way, uh, and, and like, for example, at AWS, for me, it is explicit. Like, my job essentially is to save the company, like, my personal goal is to save the company $100 million a year by uh, dramatically increasing the efficiency of the services that it operates. And the... And, and the link between spend on energy and climate is like one-to-one, -one, essentially. Now, I don't think for a smaller scale business that is as compelling, but I think every bit helps. I don't know. I don't I, I want to give you a really positive answer, but sadly, I need to be slightly more realistic. Yeah, I have a question. So um, I started off my journey in JavaScript and then eventually went to Golang. And I was able to pick up a lot of Golang relatively quick because there was a lot of resources on YouTube around patterns and you know, there's idiomatic Go and whatnot. Um, what do you suggest is a good way for a company to bring that, bring, like, that similar type of learning style in Rust uh, within the organization? Because I personally have looked on YouTube and try to find like, you know, idiomatic Rust or Rust patterns, for instance, and you know, there's like the builder pattern and stuff like that, but there's no like, uh, you know, idiomatic way to do something. It's just a very flexible language. So how do you, I guess, find the, the right patterns to bring within the organization? Uh, and I know a lot of it's still being worked out, right? And it's, it's relatively So new. I think that, uh, so just to cut you off, um, the, <laughs> well, it turns out, <laughs> I've been fast like on, like, uh, I've got three children now, so my YouTube channel is kind of decrepit. Um, but uh, just keep looking is my answer to that. Rust is growing. The reason why, but Rust was late. Rust, uh, for a while, was perceived as like Rust versus Go, you know, culturally Mozilla versus Google. Uh, they both came out looking very similar. Uh, Rust had uh, green threading, Go had green threading. Uh, they were both attempting to fight this kind of concurrency thing, so it seemed like, well, <laughs> duh, I'm just gonna go Google. And it turns out that um, Rust is different, and they, the Rust team, before 1.0, was extremely deliberate at designing a very good programming language. Now, uh, that was methodical and, and uh, but it's only been very recently, oh, the other thing, it's only been very recent that people might say that, like, I wanna learn Rust, because it's, it, it's always got this possible perception of being hard to learn. Uh, by the way, I was, uh, there are, you, there are, like, look at the, go, I, I would encourage you to kind of, attend the closing keynote this evening because um, he's, John's a very good uh, individual to follow on, on YouTube. And, I watch uh, his videos, you know. <laughs> the, uh, lastly, until very recently, everyone learning Rust was learning Rust as a second language. And therefore, 
there's not a great impetus to teach kind of beginner material to the Rust community. Uh, and uh, for example, like uh, I mean, th this is and the Rust surveys and so forth were uh, the com were asked for intermediate type material, and which actually further pushed the focus on pure beginners to programming even further away. I should allow another um, question to come in, by the way. <laughs> hi there. Uh, yeah, hi. I wanted to ask about something you touched on in your talk, uh, which was recruitment. Um, and I was wondering how you would refute the argument that if we adopt this crazy Rust language, we'll never be able to hire anyone who knows it. Uh, and perhaps to give a specific example, the the argument that, well, it's hard enough to hire C++ developers, so how are we ever going to find anyone who knows Rust? Right. The, uh, so this is a, the most horrible dichotomy that I think uh, I've encountered uh, in my career. The fact that we have this growing body of people who want jobs in Rust and a growing body of companies wanting to hire developers. And yet, this horrible chasm whereby people can't find jobs and people can't find stuff. And uh, so the answer to can I find anybody would be, <laughs> I would be curious to, if you could run an experiment. So one way would, do, would be, like, what would happen if we put out a job ad? Like, let's validate whether or not we could find uh, anybody. Because my hunch and my intuition is that you will be surprised at the quality and caliber of individuals who are actively seeking to essentially lift themselves up into a, in, in, into a programming environment that does provide things like safety and performance. And um, now, I, there will always be stories of companies that can't find people. And my advice there would be to participate actively in the community and try to be, like, have a technical blog. And to make it very obvious in, that you are interested in welcoming people into the community. We can, like, as we can, like, be a little bit, uh, we can introspect our own group here and say that, like, we're not the most diverse audience. That means that our industry has excluded a large number of people who really want to work in technology. Now, this isn't unique to Rust. You don't need to blame the language for that, Rust. Uh, but my argument, or at least my view, is that we don't so much have a recruitment problem, we have a bias problem. And if we are a little bit more sophisticated in how we recruit and uh, really appeal to a, a, an audience, as well as being very open with thinking about skills rather than perhaps experience, we might be able to find that our, uh, our, our we might find that a fraction of this recruitment problem will be addressed. Hello. Yeah. Hi there. Um, so uh, I love Rust, and I'm going to attempt to use it wherever I can, where it makes sense. I make, my question to you really is, when doesn't it make sense? Just as a background, I come from the Scala community, and I think we did quite a lot of harm trying to push it, like in the front end and places like that. So where doesn't Rust make sense? So I don't think like Rust works very well on like an interactive. So I um, come from an explorer. Uh, uh, I don't. I come from a data science kind of field, and the notebook workflow um, is, is kind of very uh, well established in the research community and kind of having almost like malleable code. I don't think that Rust does very well in kind of interactive or an exploratory thing. I think it does much better than you might expect for things that you might have turned to, say, a Python or even Bash 
for writing scripts that will be like run as cron jobs. Maybe not for the initial version, but for uh, bits and pieces that live uh, in the background that you don't want to touch very, very often. And by the way, you don't want their uh, dependencies to kind of update on the back end and then suddenly like, the, the Python versions don't match and or any of that kind of stuff. Um, that's less of a problem with Rust. The other thing that I think Rust doesn't do as well would be, uh, no, I'm, I'm much too much of a, like, a maniacal fanatic to answer that with any genuine, like, I, I think that, that essentially it's a very good general purpose programming language. And um, that means I can't answer that question with any decency, sorry. Hello. Um, so maybe a slightly weird question, but similar, but, uh, similar to the previous one is, we also as the team decided to give Rust uh, a serious try, and, uh, and uh, we hoped it would work for us, but maybe it wouldn't. And uh, a natural question that arises is, when should we reevaluate? And uh, some people say, like, maybe uh, should we evaluate end of the quarter, but obviously, like, Rust is not the kind of language that you, like, basically, this couple of, first couple of months is always where all the pain is. So what do you think is a reasonable time frame to reevaluate um, uh, the use of, like, Rust? Mm, that's Rust an interesting thing. question. So when we should we, let's say we tried it for something and then it didn't quite work, so we, you know, kind of put it on the back burner and have a look at it again. A weird way of answering that might be with a staffing change. Often, so I was going to say that, uh, and I'm looking at around to see what I'm, how, how we're going for time. Uh, hopefully we're still good. Uh, the, uh, I mentioned earlier that the forces of darkness will kind of come. And what I meant by that was uh, often people in the team, the developer community, tech lead, probably are very happy with Rust. Senior management hears all of this hype. You know, I love memory safety, I love that. Saving money, awesome, perfect. That's, that's the ticket. But, you know, like as sort of an engineering manager level, or someone who's really interested in like maintaining the Jira board, kind of middle management, I don't mean to like disparage anybody. But um, that's where the fear comes in. And that's where a lot of those evaluations are decided. Because you have people who have been bitten by people. There are probably some NoSQL databases in the stack somewhere from six years ago or something else that we now need to maintain because someone thought it was a good idea. And that's why I think that it's really important to focus on technical excellence so that you don't just try to say, oh, good, <laughs> we're doing Rust today, because that's not really going to be a strategy that will last um, into the long term. Hey, hello there. Um, I'm, I'm a software developer, but I also teach code to, to non-technical people. So, um, I have never teach Rust as a first programming language. But what you just mentioned it, probably as a challenge inspired me. I just want to try it. And because I have the power to design the kind of courses and for this academy, I wonder if you have tips, don'ts, do's. I, I do not. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, I want to also but I don't want to experiment with people, you know? Like, I, <laughs> um, a, yeah, no, no, I, I would be learning. So, so a group that is really useful to join, if you are involved in, um, in education or um, the academic side um, in any way, uh, look, look up rust-edu.org. Um, is a group of largely academics, but um, slightly broader than that. Um, it has some membership within industry as well, uh, and they are attempting to create a uh, sort of a structured course curriculum, um, for example. The idea behind it would be, um, I think, more at that tertiary university level, but there must be a lot more. Um, that they, the scope could all easily broaden if there are interested people. Um, 
Hello. Hey. Hi. Hi. Um, do you think when we teach Rust, we can uncover it in layers, sort of? Can uh, you? We could you uh, like Rust is like really diverse, really rich language, and you can implement quite a lot of things just using a subset. Uh, well, I know I, I know because I tried. I implemented microservice that reading from external API push into Kafka without any single mentioning of uh, like lifetimes or anything like that because it's, it's it has move semantics, so it ha happily moves uh, values for you. If you if you don't introduce like for example yeah, and, unnecessarily and, uh, copy trade for example, mm -hmm. then you you basically implement in very straightforward language the code. It's not that much different from your Python, but your memory footprint is still, so you're not compromising on anything. And you're using a small subset and it's easy. So when I, when I was explaining it to my teammates, it was. This is fascinating. So like, could we create like, uh, like a beginner subset, right? Or not even beginner, but like a good enough Rust uh, Without compromise. Th that doesn't require lifetimes, it doesn't require this. Or, um, now, I actually also tried to do that. So by the way, if you read Rust in action, you'll notice that there are very few mentions of traits. That we kind of exclude traits from what gets taught in that book because it's explicitly there to be accessible to people who have never used like a, str like a strongly typed programming language. They wouldn't know what an interface is. Uh, and so I think there is some merit to say that you could get away with clone a lot of in a, in a lot of places. I think that as long as you had a like a, a, a clear path to the rest of the language, it there's no real harm in starting small because of you know we had this long list of questions and uh, that we we had to give answers to that come up as people learn. And what we want to do is give people confidence such that when they feel frustrated, they can actually fall back on a lot of knowledge that they've already gained while being able to build projects. Because that confidence will grow and uh, it'll, it'll, it will only really grow with, with, it, with, with time and therefore uh, shielding people, I think, from the complexities of lifetimes and so forth um, can make sense. There would be an idea that... Well, you, uh, the, the only problem would be that if they go and look something up in the standard library, well, suddenly they're encountered, like, like they suddenly... It's like, is, is this hieroglyphs? <laughs> like, and just these horrible type signatures from some of these complex generics and lots of... Uh, it's like... That's what you kind of need to, to, to guard people against. To say, well, by the way, you know, stay in your, you know, to take the coral analogy, you know, stay by the coral. Don't go into the deep ocean, um, maybe, if you've followed Finding Nemo, for example. Hey, um, what would you say to people asking about the velocity of development or how fast you can get the features out of the door using Rust compared to other languages. Yeah, okay, so velocity. Like we gotta get we gotta ship it, right? So the build the build process of like a Python or a node, um, or PHP even, is like the compile time, you hit save, that's your build system. Awesome. Uh, but stuff breaks all the time. And my argument would be that uh, over the course of the lifetime of the, the project, your kind of net velocity, yes, you will be slower to start. You know, the startup time will, uh, the, the start time will be slower, but your top speed will be higher. Uh, thanks so much for this talk. It's uh, incredibly relevant for me. Uh, what path would you recommend for getting Rust on the list of sanctioned languages at a skeptical company, especially one with a centralized, opinionated Bazel build, build system <laughs> owned by a separate team? <laughs> How do you get the green light in the first place? Uh, do it under the radar? <laughs> I don't know a lot of the origin story about Rust at AWS, but I think it essentially became a problem. W it was essentially... Because uh, I'm pretty new. I'm nine months into the job. And uh, what I've heard is that 
It was the only thing that would be fast enough. Essentially, find some problem such that you would turn to C++, but you can't go there because you are too worried that you are a human who is not capable of perfection. <laughs> um, uh, by the way, uh, and if you can find some problem space that actually seriously demands that kind of performance, your alternatives are Rust or not, sh not or, or shipping something that's broken, and uh, shipping something that's damaging to your users. You're exposing them to security breaches. You are um, people aren't unreasonable. They're just def they're just cautious. People and don't think that you are uh, that people are saying no to Rust. What they're saying no to is lots of expense, lots of um, things like we can't hire people, or we don't want to be left maintaining something that we can't maintain into the future. Um, these, this anxiety is genuine and is justified. So start small, but um, but 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 don't be afraid to bring out the big guns like, and say, well, actually. We can do better than seek faults. Like we don't, we we don't need to have an application that falls over every so often. Actually, we can just try Rust out. Question here. Oh God. So we're all on Team Rust here, right? So we're <laughs> preaching to the choir. Um, taking it to the different angle, what could Rust do today as a language to smooth out the learning path? that today we know is because a little bit vertical. Yeah, yeah, right. It's like a more of a learning cliff. Um, so, so there's kind of two philosophies here. Uh, one is we get better at teaching Rust. The second one is we kind of adjust Rust and maybe create some subset or kind of, you know, smooth out the learning curve essentially by chain, like, like uh, to use the cliff analogy, we kind of be like earthworks. Um, like get the bulldozers like out and adjust, <laughs> adjust the, the, the curve. I think, so like, the second one is like essentially saying Rust is done. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally, we cannot change the language. It's more or less fixed. Uh, I believe that focusing more on the learning materials, trying to make things around patterns and uh, is a better use of the community's time right now because uh, even at a company that has the resources to hire compiler engineers, they're still, everyone's busy. And we can't go through an RFC process to convince thousands. I, I just, I feel like, like, what would you change? The thing that I would change would be string. I would create like a text type that would be probably type alias to something like cow lifetime underscore stir, right? And like have that as like the primary string type, and somehow make that ergonomic and work. Because what I hate trying to explain to people is they're playing around with integers, and they work through toy, a few toy examples, and then suddenly get this thing like value, uh, what is the error? Uh, value used after move? And it's like the variables haven't changed, you have to change the types, so I'm suddenly now using strings, and now I'm getting borrow problems. And if we could somehow smooth that out, uh, because th I think that would be really handy. Because the problem with saying, explaining the distinction between a string and a string slice, or, you know, everyone's favorite pretzel stir, pretzel stir, is uh, that <laughs> to explain strings, you essentially need to explain the entire language. And like, well, you've got references, and we have a reference to some uh, range, a slice of bytes that happen to be encoded as UTF-8, and by the way, that is tied to the lifetime of the... the <laughs> Whoa, like, what have I done? <laughs> I've just, I just, I see my audience just walking out of the room. Uh, and, but I don't, I thought about that string problem a lot, uh, but I've I got no decent answer to it. I would love for strings to be easy-ish to use, but you can't do that in Rust because Rust really cares about being uh, very precise. And I don't think that is a quality that you want to give up. So we need to get better at teaching Rust. 
Oh, there's been a gentleman who has uh, had his hand up right at the back. Um, I, I was going to say, I'm oh, afraid we're, we're, out. we're out of time for questions. Uh, I'm sure you're probably out of books by now. <laughs> <the number> of <laughs> questions. Um, so can we have a, a, a round of applause? for Big Tim. round of applause for Tim. And, and just on another point, just on another point, we are going to be carrying on this conversation at the post-conference brunch with Red Badger. So if you look out for the details of that, or if you find, is Jimmy, Jimmy's not in the room. I don't know if Stu is in the room. You can give us a wave. Stu's here, give him a wave. Over there. If the you can find Stu, right. we're gonna be having a post-conference brunch focused on Rust in Enterprise. So if you want to talk more about this, if you wanna tackle this more, uh, we'll be able to carry on this conversation tomorrow at the brunch. So please give Tim another massive hand. There was a little Easter egg we forgot to do just before you go. We're going to pick um, five people at random, and Tim's going to get you a signed book, right? Yeah. You all good with that? Yeah. I'll Great. just need to go so, grab them. Um, I'm going to get a, a random number generator going, and then I'll pick five.